Good evening and Merry Christmas to everyone. My name is Tim Bedall and I have the great privilege of serving as lead pastor here at Village Bible Church and on behalf of our staff and, and leadership and all the great people not only here at the Shergrove campus but across our five campuses, we would like to say from Village Bible Church to extend you uh, the most glorious and blessed Christmas uh, greetings to you and our invitation for you to come, if you don't have a church home, uh, to come some Sunday and join us and learn a little bit about what we're all about. We love to see what God is doing and how God is on the move, not only in the Fox Valley area, but all over the world. And it's our great privilege to have you here with us to celebrate Christmas at Village Bible Church. Well, the Christmas season is a great time, and there are so many parts of the Christmas season that I love to celebrate and enjoy, and one of the traditions in the Badal home we have is when we receive cards and photos from our friends both near and far, we, we take those and we tape them up on one of our doorposts just to remind us as we are going and, and coming to uh, pray for them and to think of them and the great wishes that they send. Well, I didn't get this card that I'm going to show you in the mail at home. I got it in my church office just a couple of days ago, and it came from a young lady in our congregation, and my heart was so filled with joy when I saw it because it was sitting on my desk, and, and it said, Merry Christmas, and it was this hand-drawn card of a Christmas tree and, of course, baby Jesus in a manger, in the hay, with the star, and if you can notice, a little heart right above the star. And this took some time, and, and this took some real desire to bless her pastor. And uh, this young lady that uh, took the time to do it put a note on the inside. And before I show you what the note said, I, my heart began to race because I was thinking, Number one, how awesome is this that a young uh, child would be willing to take time and draw a picture and send a card to her pastor? And what note must be inside? The note of how great I am as a pastor, maybe how good looking I am for being 43 years of age, maybe the incredible eloquence of which I speak, maybe just gratitude, just Christmas blessings flowing from that a young child's mind and heart, and I opened it, and this is what it said. Thank you for serving our church. We love your long sermons. God bless you. Merry Christmas. Yeah, yeah. You clap too long, I'll make it a longer sermon. Well, she is getting a lump of coal in her stocking tonight, but Christmas greetings and Christmas cards remind us that within our heart there is room for others in our lives. And as a church, we have been studying the different characters of the Christmas season. We've done so under this title, The Cast of Christmas, and we've looked at some great characters. We've looked at the prophets and the job that they had of telling hundreds of years in advance the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We then talked about the angels who brought in song and in message the story that Christ was born in Bethlehem, and then how the shepherds who heard that went and told all those that they knew, including Mary and Joseph, that they had had angels appear to them announcing the birth of Jesus. We've talked about some great characters in that first Christmas story. But we've also talked about some bad ones. We talked about Herod one week and how Herod, out of his selfishness and his own uh, deceiving heart, made a decision to make Jesus a competition instead of king, and how he sought to destroy Christmas. Well, we've studied this cast of Christmas because inherently within this Christmas story is a reminder for you and me that all of us have a part to play in the story God is writing. And the question tonight is, is that part that you're playing, is it about God or is it about yourself? Are you writing of God's glory and His grace and His love and His mercy, or are you writing about your own accolades and aspirations and dreams? You see, we've got a choice this Christmas in the part that we play. We can either choose to give ourselves over to God and His work in the world and find joy, peace, and contentment in the abundant life that Jesus Christ came to give, 
Or we can write our story for ourselves and like Herod, be burdened, lost, and without hope. And the real question tonight is, with regards to the part that we play, is there room for Jesus in that story? You see, we've read already in Luke chapter 2 that there was no room for Jesus in the end. In fact, this is how Luke articulates it. He puts the following uh, there, if we can throw it on the screen. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger. Why? Why a manger? Because there was no room for them in the inn. That first Christmas, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, the Redeemer of the world, came to a little town in Bethlehem, and in doing so, you would have thought, you would have imagined that every door would have been flung open, that every room would have been made available. Now, why was Mary and Joseph in need of a room? Well, we are told at the beginning of this passage that Caesar Augustus, the emperor of the Roman Empire, had issued a decree and that every person was to go to the place of their family's birth and to go and pay taxes and be counted. And so Joseph goes, being in the line and lineage of David, he goes to the city of David, Bethlehem, to go and be counted. And what this census would do would be to cause a great migration of people. People would go far and wide. For Joseph and Mary, it was a 70 or 80 mile journey. And they would come, and without the help of Hotels.com or Travelocity, you didn't know if you had a room until you got there. And I can only imagine Joseph going from door to door, house to house, Uh, starting out probably relatively calm, and as the night progressed and as Mary progressed in not only her pregnancy but in the labor pains, that the earnestness of Joseph, the heaviness of the knocks on the door, the, the sweating of the brow, is there room for us? Can we find a room only to hear again and again? There was no room for them in the inn. Now, right away, we think when we hear about the word inn, we think about hotels. We think about uh, places like the Sheraton and the Marriott and, and places like that. In Bethlehem in the first century, those weren't what the inn was all about. What these were were these were places, rooms within people's homes that they would offer out of hospitality for a small portion of money. And it seems as if all of Bethlehem had no room. And so what we have done is we've created this character. Even though the Bible doesn't talk about it, we've created this character called the innkeeper. Now, the Bible never says anything about the innkeeper, even though in every Christmas pageant, there's an innkeeper. He usually has an Italian a voice, a mafia-type spirit, and he is played by usually a, a, a young man who's full of energy. And his job is to present this idea that not only is there no room, but seemingly the door is shut and this cruel innkeeper has kept the holy family from having a place for Jesus to be born. But none of that is in Scripture. And that makes the innkeeper the most obscure of all characters in the cast of Christmas. And so what do we know about it? We know the one fact. There was no room for them in the inn. Now, we don't know if there was one, two, or three innkeepers, or maybe dozens of innkeepers, no matter how many doors he knocked. There was no place. But what could have caused a town like Bethlehem to say no to the king who had been promised, the Messiah, the Savior who had come to rescue his people? What kept people from doing that? Well, let me speculate for a moment, maybe three reasons as to why those individuals found no room for Jesus that first Christmas. The first one maybe is ignorance. Ignorance, that is, they didn't know that they were talking with the Holy Family. They didn't know that uh, the baby in the womb of that young maiden would be the Savior of the universe. They didn't know that 
on that great and glorious night when they said there was no room in their home or in the inn, that they were turning away the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Maybe they just didn't know. Maybe, and, and some of us go there because maybe we're a little more cynical or maybe we've lived in the real world for a period of time. Maybe they were indifferent. What I mean by that is uh, they play the part of the innkeeper. The innkeeper, the callous, the angry, uh, the money-hungry guy who's more worried about making a profit than caring for others. Because really, could you imagine a young family coming to your front door, seemingly a lady that is in labor, crying out for some comfort amidst her pain, for a room to be had, only to have the door shut, maybe, maybe it was indifference. Or maybe it was that all of Bethlehem was just too involved with their own lives. That is, they were too busy. Maybe it was that they were so involved in the comings and goings of the census, all of these people making their way into the city of David. Maybe, quite possibly, they were just too busy to find themselves room to make a place for Jesus. Can I tell you today, those same th three things keep us from making room for Jesus? We're ignorant to the fact that Jesus wants to take residence in our heart. Oh, we've heard the story, but maybe we've not given a true listening or a hearing that Jesus wants to take residence in all of our lives, and maybe we're hearing that for the first time. Maybe we're indifferent. Maybe we don't care. Yeah, we know Jesus came. We know the story. We, we know the songs, but maybe, quite frankly, we don't really care. Jesus lived a long time ago. He hasn't done anything for me, in my opinion. So why should I worry? Why should I make room for him? For many, maybe it's busyness. Maybe amidst all of our Christmas celebrations, we have forgotten Jesus. Sometimes Christmas has a way of drowning out the true meaning of the season. Uh, this evening, this afternoon, my wife, Amanda, who loves Christmas, had a list of things that she needed to do. And I said, how's your Christmas? She goes, look at the list. It's not all done yet. And they were all good things. But aren't we like that a lot? Where our lists get filled up and, and before we know it, and this isn't true of my wife, of which I'm thankful, but we, we get maybe the list done, but we never take time to celebrate Jesus. Could it be that we don't have room for Jesus? That little town of Bethlehem had a great opportunity to receive her king, but it didn't make room. Tonight, I want you to walk away with one encouragement or challenge, and that is that amidst this Christmas celebration, make room, make time, make a place for Jesus. But how do we do that? There are three things that I'll leave you with tonight as we close out this portion of the service. Number one, to make room for Jesus this Christmas means to make room for the gospel. To make room for the gospel, that is the good news of Jesus Christ. That we who are sinners, all of us, and, and are at odds with God, we are enemies of God, Jesus came at Christmas to be our Savior, to redeem us back to God, to do what we couldn't do because of our sins on our own. So God sent his son Jesus to die for us that we might have a relationship with Jesus. Now, the Bible says to all those who will receive him, to those who will believe on his name, that he will allow them to become children of God. That is, is that we have an opportunity to become the children of God in right relationship with God. But did you know, just like that first Christmas, Jesus is looking for rooms now? In Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. 
And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into them and I will dine with them and they will be with me. You see, Jesus is wanting you to invite him in. And if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, you've never truly experienced Christmas because what Christmas is about is the joy and the love and the mercy and the hope that Jesus brings to those who make room for him. The second thing that we need to do it is for those who have trusted Christ as their Savior. And maybe you know uh, that you for, for some time have known Christ and have made room for Christ. Well, to make room for Christ means to make room for others. And what that means is we need to, as followers of Christ, make room for generosity. The Bible makes it clear that someone obviously made room. There was a manger for them. Someone opened their hands, someone opened their heart to that holy family which allowed Jesus to be born. Now listen, what was offered wasn't all that great. It wasn't all that fancy. Surely it was not all that first class. But what was offered was just what was needed on that fateful night. And it was what that individual had. And Jesus would be born in a manger amidst all manner of animals and all manner of things that seemingly the king of the universe would never enter into. But it shows our great Savior's humility to be placed in such a place in his first experience in this world, in the flesh, to be born. But it began out of a heart of generosity. So let me ask you tonight, if you've opened your heart and life to the gospel, how generous are you? When it comes to your life, are you willing to extend a helping hand, open your home, and do what you can to serve others? In Matthew 25, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he says, on the great and glorious day of judgment, you will be brought in, and, and I will thank you, Jesus says. I will thank you because when I was hungry, you fed me. And when I was naked, you clothed me. And when I needed drink, you gave me drink. And when I was in prison, you came and visited me. And the disciples said, wait a minute, Jesus. When did we come and clothe you when you were naked? When did we welcome you in as a stranger? When did we feed you when you were hungry, give you drink when you were thirsty? When were you in prison that we came and visited you? And Jesus said, what you do to the least of these, my brothers, you have done unto me. You see, we need to recognize as God has bestowed grace upon us this Christmas season, that it is our job and might I add our responsibility as Christ followers to show that generosity to others both those who are closest with us, and we will do that in a couple moments or maybe tomorrow. We'll gather in our rooms and we'll open up gifts and we'll share love and generosity to those closest to us. But might I encourage all of us to show generosity to those we work with, to those we live nearby, to those strangers that we've never maybe crossed paths with. Show generosity. Make room for generosity. Finally, Let's make room for grace this Christmas. The Bible says that Jesus came, and one of the things that he came to do was to forgive us of our sins. That is, the things that we had done against God and against others. Jesus came, that baby would be born and would live a perfect life so that he might die, so that in our place we might find forgiveness and grace in our time of need. And just as Christ has forgiven us, we are told in the Scriptures that we are to forgive as He has forgiven us. And so I know Christmas, for many, is a very happy time. But for many families, for many people here, Christmas is the worst time of the year. And the reason why is broken relationships and, and all kinds of water under bridges and all kinds of struggles that have happened and have taken place in the past. And, and, and at this time of the year, it's really, really easy to grow bitter, to grow hardened in our offenses. But I want to encourage you, as I've been encouraged even as I've studied this passage, to think about what grace am I to extend? You know, I can't 
receive the forgiveness of God unless I'm willing to forgive those. Jesus told his disciples that we were to pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have debts against us. And so this Christmas, as we make room for Jesus and make room for the good news that he wants to be in our lives, and he wants to be the ruler and savior of our souls, then we too should live with open hands and open hearts, extending grace as God himself has extended grace to us. So this evening, on this most holy of nights, while in Bethlehem there was no room, let it be said of us, let it be said of those in this place that we make room for the king and that we make room for our Savior. Because unless we make room, my friends, we will never experience the joy and the peace and the love and the mercy that makes Christmas the most wonderful time of the year. Amen? Let me pray for us. Father God, thank you so much for your word, and thank you so much for the indescribable gift of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray for those here now, and I pray a blessing upon them. I pray that you would fill the rest of this Christmas season with great joy and hope and peace. I pray that their gatherings will be ones of great uh, joy and festivity. But amidst all of that, Lord, I pray that in every heart we would make room. That, Lord, out of the words of joy to the world, that we would have great joy. That we would receive our King. That every heart would prepare Him room so that heaven and nature can sing. And so, Lord, I pray if someone here tonight has never trusted you as their Savior, that tonight they would truly make room for you. And, Lord, for those who have known you, that we would make room to give. We would make room to show grace, that people might see that we are Christians because of the great love that we have for others. We love you, Lord, and we thank you, and we praise you for the night that you came and became one of us, that we might not only know now how to live, but that we might experience eternal life through the finished work you did on the cross. We love you and give you praise for it all. In Christ's name we pray, amen.